It's this week's wrestling perspective. Myself, Dennis Farrell, and my co-host, Petey Williams. How's she going, eh? Actually, you're the host, and I'm the co-host, right? Uh, no, I think it's... No, we're, we're co-hosts. We're co-hosts. I like that. Yeah. Uh, before we get into the nuts and bolts of this week's podcast, we sit down with Killer Cross, and he tells all. It was a, a good interview. Uh, we got let's let's knock out the super quick promotions. Uh, go to bluechew.com, use the promo code perspective. It uh, it helps enhance your your activities in bed. Uh, use the promo code perspective. Don't forget uh, let's see here. Wrestling perspective radio heard on over a hundred radio stations all over the United States with myself and Russ McCall. K- Pete. I don't know if you know this, but we're about to announce here in two seconds a new podcast we're doing here on this same feed that you're listening to right now. Oh, I heard rumors about that. Um, I'm excited for that. Let's let's hear it. So myself and Dave Christ from OVE, who is mm-hmm. a huge sports fan, he has been after me for months and months and months to do a, a, a podcast with him. And now I've kind of fought it only because I just didn't have time. I'm doing... You know, when football season starts, a fantasy football one. I'm doing this with you. I'm doing the radio show. And he, and he finally talked me into it. I came up, by the way, I came up with this name. Tell me what you think about this name. Are you ready? Okay. It's going to be called Wrestling with Sports. That's almost perfect, I would say. That's it, like almost the perfect. Like, so what's the description? Uh, sell me on it in like two sentences or so. Oh, I can't in two sentences, but let me try to sell you on it. Are you ready? Okay. Yeah. We're going to take your favorite wrestlers and talk sports, and we're going to take your favorite athletes who love wrestling and talk wrestling with them. That's two sentences pretty much. Okay. Two thoughts. Did so I, that's perfect. Wrestling with sports. Did, did I sell you? Yeah, that's great. So you can have like somebody like, let's say I'm not your co-host, uh, somebody like Petey Williams on and, hey, let's talk about stuff that's not wrestling yep and then you have a wrestler on like uh okay dave christ and he could talk about oh no i'm sorry you have to have an athlete on so an athlete like uh uh who, who do we get like well we, um, we have names booked already yeah so i mean not to give anything away but you could have like professional baseball player let's say and he'll talk wrestling so yes yes um that's that's perfect i don't think there's a podcast like that there probably is now that somebody's gonna be like tweet us and like oh i've been doing it for two years and just nobody listens to us but um <laughs> that's that's probably gonna that's probably gonna happen because it always happens to us we think we come up with these great ideas and then somebody's like i've been doing this forever whatever well you'll find it here on the same feed the deal is we're gonna keep it on the same feed and if it grows and people like it then we'll move it over to its own dedicated feed and we'll be back to just you me and the radio show here uh if people like it and or if they don't like it, then they probably won't ever call me back again. So we'll we'll see how this plays out. Yeah, he'll say this doesn't work. So, Petey, let's do a podcast, me and you. And yeah. like, oh no, oh well, no. Let's cut the nerdy guy out. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but uh, so far booked, we have Dimitri Young, former Detroit uh, Tiger, which we're gonna All actually right. you and I were gonna sit down and talk with soon. Uh, yep. We have George Kittle. The, the glowing tight end from the San Francisco 49ers, probably the number two tight end right now in fantasy football. Uh, let, gosh, I'm trying to think of who else. we. Uh, Tommy Dreamer is going to come on and talk baseball. Joey Ryan's going to come on and talk baseball. So we're, we're, it's going to be pretty interesting and diverse. Yeah, so I mean, you got the first like month or so booked and stuff, or maybe two months. D'Angelo Williams and... too will come yeah. on. So yeah, and then hey, if you have Moose on, what's he going to talk about? Well, Both? maybe you know. I think Moose is kind of like Monty Brown, where Monty doesn't really like to talk football anymore, even though he's won a Super Bowl with the New England Patriots. And I kind of think that's where Moose is right now in his life. I don't know if he's won a Super Bowl. I think he played in two Super Bowls: one with Buffalo, one with New England. Well, if it's with uh, Buffalo, then he certainly didn't win. Yeah, yeah. I think it was one, you know, obviously one of the four that they lost. But, um, yeah, I don't, anyways, we're, we totally digressed on that one. Yeah. Um, wrestling but, with sports. <laughs> yeah, wrestling with sports. The That's great. Here. So uh, make sure we have her a Twitter handle. It's called Wrestling WS. So at Wrestling WS with sports, just in case you're like, what's WS mean? That's what it means. Make sure you go over there and follow it. Dave and I will both be tweeting from it. I, maybe we'll try to get you on as a guest. Do you even like sports? Uh, yeah, and you know what? I, I don't talk about it a lot. Um, and my wife 
like doesn't even know that I like sports. And then we'll be out and about with whoever, maybe like couples night or like we're, we're with another couple or something. And then me and the dude start talking sports and she looks at me like, how do you know how many wins like Golden State has this year? And, you know, how, how do you know who the top? And I'm like, I follow this. I'm like, I'm just not going to talk to you about it because you don't want to. I mean, she's not going to want to talk sports, right? Just like she doesn't want to talk wrestling. Right. So, yeah, no, I, I definitely watch sports. Um, really upset that the Raptors lost last. Uh, yeah, it was last night, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I hope they could take it home in game six. Um, you know, and then we have game seven of Stanley Cup right now that we have to get to. Yep, yep, I'm watching it. So, Pete, uh, next week, and maybe I'll try to get you on sooner in a week because we were super late this week. We didn't even do one last week because of your booking, maybe? No, it was... No, it was at tapings. You were at tapings, so we didn't do one last week. We did one later this week. Uh, we have an Ask PD show where we have about 40 or so questions, so it means you still have time now to get your questions in and uh, a bunch of other news to talk about impact-wise. So maybe we'll try to double book this week and maybe record something Sunday or Monday. It depends on who's free and whatnot. But, uh, Pete, are you ready to, to talk to Kill Across here? Oh, I'm, I'm always ready. All right. Uh, I guess here we go. All right, Pete, this is kind of the interview I didn't think we'd get, but here we are now. And uh, last time we talked to Killer Cross, it was, you know, flowers and roses. He was excited. Here we are now. God, what would you say? Six, seven months ago. Now we're here. There was a report that recently came out on the internet that Killer Cross asked for his release. And he chose to speak with you and I about this issue, Pete. Oh, well, um, I mean, well, Kevin, welcome to the show. Um, good to have you here again. Um, I think last time we spoke, it was, uh, man, I mean, I think it was before you were like in the main event picture and stuff like that. It was, I think it was shortly after you came on board with impact, but, uh, now here we are. Um, man, I don't know. It's almost been like a year later. I want to say, I say so. Thank you for having me. And I, just to clarify, I, I still think there are flowers and roses. They're just now surrounded, uh, you know, a, a fucking casket guys. I'm kidding. Everything is everything is fine. Um, you know, uh, just to to a degree that uh, we will clarify, I guess, by the end of all of this. But uh, yeah, this is a lot of time has passed, and um, yeah, we have we have much ground to cover, I suppose. Let, let's start this out by a few weeks ago. A report came out that you had asked for your release with Anthem. Uh, I. Don't know anything beyond that, so let me ask you, were those reports true? They were 100% true. Do you, when you wake up, and I'm, I'm sure you didn't go around saying, hey everybody, uh, I'm asking for my release, but when you wake up the next day, then you see this out there, what was your first thought? So like, I'll, I'll preface it kind of like this. Um <clears throat> I think both of you guys know, and anyone who actually uh, even or even like remotely knows me, I'm a very private person. So I think that anyone who sincerely could have said that they knew me or know me now currently, it it would have been very black and white that uh, none of that information came from me. And if anyone knew me um, very well, they would have known how I reacted, uh, which was I threw probably like a killer cross esque tantrum in public for real. Wow. Um, I was, I was, <laughs> I was in, the, I was in the mountains. Um, I was in the Sequoias for Scarlett's birthday. And, uh, when the article broke, I didn't even have a signal. I had stopped off in a restaurant cause I was still in the process of trying to basically find a common ground with where I wanted to be with the company. Um, I was chatting with Scott, um, and uh, various other people in the company. So I stopped into a restaurant momentarily. I, and I think it was, I think it was mother's day. So I stopped in a restaurant. I got a signal and, uh, reached out to my mother my grandmother's, my aunts. Um, and, um, I still hadn't even seen the article. I think it, I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, it did break on mother's day. I saw it the following day. So you can imagine when I get my signal, when I get back into Los Angeles, my phone completely explodes and it took me, it was kind of surreal. It took me a little bit of time 
to actually process uh, what had happened. And no one outside of my immediate family had that much detail uh, regarding the information that broke than just uh, my employers. So immediately, you know, I'm just thinking that somebody that I was speaking with in confidence was gossiping to the wrong person. Not even maliciously. I don't even think it was malicious. I just think that they were they were probably talking to the wrong people and it got out. Um, I was fucking furious. And I can't think of a better way to explain that. I was just really, really angry because I'm still very happy at Impact. Um, and I hate to disappoint anyone listening. I have nothing disparaging whatsoever to say about the company. I get along with everyone and it's been... Um, it's been an amazing experience. I have nothing negative whatsoever at all to say about the company. But um, as we will continue into this conversation, there are uh, things that, you know, I am attempting to find a common ground with, I guess, with my position and role uh, in all things impact. Do you, I guess I should ask then, what spurred your request to be released? I guess that's the big question, whether you know, what was true on the dirt sheets or not from your point of view, what was the, 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 the emphasis of you being asking for this? So, uh, I gotta, I mean, I would have to take you, I'd have to take everybody back to the point where I wasn't even working with the company. Um, I had a certain level of comprehension that I was led to where certain things were available and certain things were not available uh, at um, my prior point of employment with the company. And uh, I had an idea of where I would like to be and what my value was coming in. And, um, you know, they had another idea. So, you know, I decided to humbly pay my dues and showcase what I believed and what I was certain I knew I was going to be worth over, you know, let's say an annual period. Um, and when we got to that point, um, we just had different opinions on what that was. Um, I will, I will humbly say that, uh, you know, I barely even existed to the pro wrestling world or the industry, uh, prior to impact wrestling. That's a given, you know, um, I've never asked in my opinion for, for anything that uh, I didn't think that I deserved. I didn't think that I would be asking for anything I couldn't contribute back. But I was led to believe that it was not available. So you could, you know, you, this, and this, this kind of just goes in, in just the most general sense you could possibly think. If you, you know, get to a job and you are told that something that you're looking for is not available, and then you come to find out six months later that that's not true. Uh, it has been available and other people have it, you could imagine that you'd be, you know, uh, a little disparaged to put up lightly, you'd be spiritually disparaged to find out that, you know, whether it was deliberate or it was to another person's comprehension that you were misled, uh, to a degree about what was available and what was not available. You know, that's a little upsetting, but, do you- um, do you think some of that is kind of based on you being a young guy? And, and look, I, I, I have to toe a line here because I love impacting the guys in the in the amount of openings they give. Pete, you you work there, and I love you, Kev. We I like to think we're friends, and you won't murder me in my sleep if you ever had the chance. So, but I do have to ask a few hard questions, and and I guess one of them would be, being a young guy, do you think it was not a bit? And I don't know what said thing is, and I, it's not for me to know. You would say it if you could or would. But do you think it was based off you being a younger guy in the industry and you had to pay your dues and work up to it, or was it just something different? Uh, it could have been a variety of different factors, and that could have been one of them. And to be clear, I was totally fine at the end of the day with what I chose to accept. That's my responsibility and accountability as an adult. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That's fine. I was, you know, but the, when, when there's a certain setting that has been cultivated, and then you find out that that's not entirely accurate once you're six months deep. It's, you know, it's a little, you know, like, it's, it'll make you fucking angry. I don't know how else to say it. It's, it makes you fucking angry. It kind of feels like you were, you know, 
like they took you for a little bit of a stroll, so to speak. But again, um, I didn't put myself into a position where I, you know, necessarily was in a jam where I wasn't happy. You know, I, I can't say it enough. I've been very happy. You know, I have so many liberties I can go on and on and on about in terms of what I'm able to do and contribute to to the product. But I mean, you know, I was very, very angry. And you know, even too, I'll be, I'll be, um, I'll be personally open about it. It's my circumstances and the things that uh, that happened to me over the last year. Uh, you know, personally, you know, I have to take care of people. You know, I'm, I'm a grown man. I have people in my family I have to look after. And, you know, I said to myself, like, once this one year is up, um, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to try to find a place where all of this is going to be able to make sense. Because, you know, the novelty of play funding in your underwear goes out the window when you can't take care of your family. Like, we have, you know, anywhere between 8 and 30 minutes on television um, to take the audience away from their 9 to 5 and all their you know, uh, all the things they need to get away from when they're watching us. But once our time is up, we're back to real life. There's more time spent in real life than there is on TV. And you need to make sure that that's in order. You know what I mean? So um, that kind of prompted me to directly answer your question. That prompted me to request my relief because, my release, because, uh, you know, when we were trying to figure out where I was landing in things, it just wasn't working. Like what was being offered was not going to work. You know, I wasn't wasn't angry about that. I wasn't upset about that specifically. I I totally understood that. I you know I thought it was cool and everything, but I mean, what was what was counter offered to me, unfortunately, wasn't going to be something where I could stabilize my personal situation with my family. So it was more financial than anything. Completely. That's all it is. Completely. That's all it was. Pete. No. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to say I've been in your situation, Kevin, because uh, I haven't. Like, you know, the stuff you've been going through personally and stuff like that. The only situation similar I've been into was, you know, dealing with contracts and money and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and this is this will be leading up into my question. Um, so I remember back in 2000 and I don't know, six or something like that. Uh, contracts were way different uh, in the TNA days than they are now in Impact days. We had a, a draw system where they gave you a weekly paycheck or whatever, and then um, if you weren't working any shows, you still got that weekly paycheck. But at the end of the quarter, uh, they would you wouldn't get a bonus, and uh, the next quarter, based on what you worked, you might have a pay decrease. Right, so so it, it all lines up like. You know, you get X amount of dollars if you work a TV show. You get X amount of dollars if you work a uh, pay-per-view. You get X amount of dollars if you work a house show, so on and so forth. Uh, appearances, so on, and that goes towards your draw. And then if you make your draw and then anything you work over, it's uh, you, you get a bonus at the end of the quarter. So that's kind of how it worked. So uh, what happened was I'm um, getting my weekly paycheck. And then for about six months, they took me off television. I was just working some explosions, and I'm thinking to myself, hey, um, this isn't going to work for me. Like, that's why I say, like, I was in the same spot. I'm like, I live in Florida right now. There is no independent wrestling down in Florida because we give away at the time it was free tickets for impact. And I said, you know, I'm going to have to move. I said, I've made a name for myself on television. I could charge X amount of dollars up in the Midwest and all that kind of stuff because, you know, people still pay for wrestling up there. Um, and so I had to make the decision like, Hey man, I've got to move my whole life. And that, that's what I had to I had to do to kind of make ends meet. And then I, I'm at where I'm at right now. Um, but so did you ever th – so this is my question. You made a – you said before, no, nobody really you – were, you were a speck in the wrestling business uh, before you started with Impact. Now you're main event and stuff. I think there was even one of our weekly specials named after you. Um, uh, all, all that kind of stuff. You're in the pretty much main event picture. You're, you're the guy that people like to see on the show and stuff. They follow your character and everything like that. Do you feel like, Hey, you know what? I, I should take what I've done here. And like, you know, like on the Indies, I'm like, I could charge now like double, triple, quadruple, whatever you were making before and make ends meet that way. I mean, yeah, that's, that's obviously something that, you know, anyone is able to do um, working with the company, uh, you know, taking their ability to work independence and trying to make ends meet that way. And I mean, it's 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 more complicated than that, unfortunately. You know, it's much more complicated than that. Um, 
I mean, I, I don't know how to say it without speaking between the lines and it just being so obvious, but how do I put it? I put it like this. Let me put it like this. And you're going to really totally understand this, Petey, more than, more than most people would. <laughs> okay. So, like, the last, the last Vegas tapings we did, I had a match with Brian Cage. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but um, there was a power bomb that I took in the match off of his knee. I landed on the back of my head. Um, I've been, I've been, I've, I've gotten a concussion before. I've been flashed before. Mm. Uh, I, I can't even tell you how many times in my life I've lost count. I've been involved with com- combat sports forever, you know. And I, I'm, I'm conditioned to compose myself when something like that happens. I don't freak out. But when I got up, I had no idea what the hell was going on. I don't know what time it was. I had no clue. I just saw Brian in front of me. I saw that I was in the ring. And I just put shit together really quick. And I was like, okay, we're working. And everything kind of just came to me at light speed. And I kind of felt like I knew where we were. And um, We got to the back. And I really didn't know how to exactly identify how bad it was. So I really didn't say much about it. But uh, Brian knew I was hurt because I told him. And I, I, think he knew in, I think he knew in the ring, too. But uh, I just wasn't really thinking anything of it. By the time I got to the car, I knew something was really, really wrong. I knew something was really, really wrong. I got vertigo, uh, bright lights bothering me, physical sickness. I couldn't read. Like I was trying to read text messages on my phone, and like the letters looked upside down. Like this is the worst symptoms I've ever had from having a concussion. Like they were scary, man. And it was like that. I couldn't drive. It was like that for about two and a half, maybe three weeks. I had to do sensory deprivation. I had to be in dark rooms. I couldn't look at screens. Like I had really, really, really intense, severe concussion symptoms. They were really bad. And this is the first one that's ever happened. And I don't want to say I had like an existential crisis, but I had more of an existential revelation because in my life, I've always been the figure to take care of other people. I haven't really needed a lot. I'm a minimalist. I really don't need a lot to be happy. Um, and being in that position for the first time in my life really changed my perspective and like my philosophies, my ideologies, how I approach and observe life really, really changed from that experience. And I was looking around one day and I was just like, you know, I take care of everybody. And right now, because of what week it was and what was going on, there really wasn't a whole lot of people that were really able to, to help me through this. I actually had Scarlet with me at the time, but um, I was just looking around and I was like, you know, I don't need a whole lot, but there's a lot of people who depend on me. And here I am out there, you know, like I'm banking on myself and I'm, I'm trying to put my best stuff out there, my best content, my best foot forward. I'm doing everything I possibly can to, you know, live the dream, so to speak. And, and then something like this can happen and it's out of your control. There's nothing you can do about it. And then you're fucked. And then you were fucked because you decided to take a gamble. And, you know, some people don't have that luxury in their lives to, you know, afford themselves to do that. Like, so when we're talking about taking indie bookings and, you know, the whole, the whole plan of like building your name somewhere and going somewhere else and doing that, like if you don't have guarantees, if you're not clearing enough hypothetically to make, you know, to, to pay for health insurance, like there's a lot of pitfalls in pro wrestling and that's the business. You know what I mean? It's, that's what it is. But I just feel like, you know, nowadays there's a certain level of compliance that is, I don't know, like it, there, there's a certain level of like, you know, this is an opportunity and you should take it because this is all you got right now that's promoted out there. And I feel like a lot of people go, they, 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 they take on things that they're not thinking about like what could happen if it goes wrong, you know? And while I could do all the indie stuff and the stuff you suggest and the whatnot, I think that's like a short term solution. And that solution will go up in flames if, you know, anyone in my position that winds up happening to them. You know what I mean? So, yeah, no, uh, yeah. so to put it into a sports term and, you know, because I'm kind of the odd man out here who's not in the industry, it's almost like an NFL player going out and playing, you know, uh, touch football in the sand and blowing out his knee, es- essentially playing touch football in the sand is the indie bookings and anybody could get hurt on any bo- indie show. And you don't really want to put yourself out there for $250 on an indie show with a booker who may throw you in the ring with some guy that could easily hurt you. 
And not even the guy that could hurt you. I mean, anything could go wrong. It could be dehydration. It could be your changing altitudes. It could be it could be a million things that could go wrong. You could be sick. There's a lot of things that can go wrong out there, and eventually they do. And you know, another thing too, I wasn't even going to bring it up, but it's like, you know, there's like also the other part of like being in the ring with someone who you know you're doing the same equal amount of work to get the narrative over and you know, to do everything you're supposed to do in the job and they're, and they're getting paid six times more than you. You know, that's, you know, that's like, that's like a fucking hard pill to swallow sometimes, you know, not just for me, but I'm saying for anyone, you know, anyone who goes out there and does a job and they're perceived by the consumer on the same level. Uh, and you know, they're not making that it's, you know, and you're trying to work towards that and you know, it's just, it's difficult. You know what I mean? When the news, broke, well, uh, what time, Pete, I keep cutting you off. Go ahead. That's fine. No, I I can relate earlier on in my career. You know, I'm wrestling guys like and and like in programs with like AJ Styles and stuff like that. And I know he's getting paid more than me. Um, and and and, and other guys. But I'm like, and, you know, like even when like I was wrestling like uh, Kurt Angle on Impact and Booker T and Scott Steiner, I know they're getting paid more money than me. Um, and I, I think that's where. You know, it's tough because I'm like, you know what? Um, in my head, you know, this is years ago. I'm like, I'll get there because I know that I, as well, am making more money than some of the other people I'm working um, in the same program as well. So, sure. I mean, you know, it, yeah, it, it's kind of hit and miss. Um, I try not to have that mentality anymore because I found myself being like, I found myself being very negative and like ever since I left the wrestling business and came back, I just see stuff, you know, differently, I guess you could say, uh, it's not my primary income anymore, which is, um, yeah, you know, it's just, I, I hear where you're coming from, Kevin. Like it's, it's tough because, um, you know, like Petey Williams, not as on his way up anymore. Kevin <laughs> Cross definitely is. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I just, it's the phobia PD of like, uh, this all being over faster than you're anticipating and having nothing to show for it when you have to take care of people. That's really where it's all coming from. You know what I mean? Like when I tell you guys I'm a, mo a minimalist, like I, I mean, it's an understatement. Like I personally really don't need much. Like when I'm not, like when I'm not on the road, I'm hiking, I'm training, I'm backpacking. Like I don't live some lavish life. I don't need any of that, you know, but it's just different when you have people to take care of circumstances change in life you know you can't anticipate it so and you know everything you said it's like i mean i i know exactly what you mean and um i'm not jaded by it though i gotta tell you i'm, I'm not i'm not going or coming from a place of being you know letting it bother me or disrupt my work or anything like that it's just you know i guess this is what this is we, we're clarifying it now right i mean the dirt sheets come out and you know people uh you know, people, you know, jump to their own conclusions of it and so forth. It's, you know, I mean, I, when I, when I brought all this up and, um, we try to, you know, talk about supplementing incomes and stuff like that. It's, you know, being told like to go get another job, buy your job. I mean, that's, I don't know how else that's fucked up. Like that's, that's like, you know, you're, 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 you're struggling to make ends meet taking care of people. And, you know, your job that you can barely afford to have tells you to go get another job so you can keep that job. And, you know, it's like working at a corporation being told to, you know, like go work at McDonald's. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a weird feeling. It's a weird feeling. Now, devil's advocate here. Did you, I mean, because I think that contract structure has been there for a while at Impact. Did you kind of understand that when you signed your contract that it's kind of built where you're probably going to get less money from Impact, but you have the freedom to work other places or as many dates as possible? I mean, yes and no. I understood some of it, but there were other things that I didn't. And at the end of the day, that's that's completely on me. Okay. That's completely on me. I had a different level. I had a different level of comprehension about it, and I was very open about that. But again, that's on me. You know what I mean? I have nothing to say about that. It's At the end of the day, it's my hand to pen and pen on paper, you know? But I did have a different, I did have a different level of comprehension about that. When the news broke, from what I saw, there was a mixed reaction on the internet about this. And how did fans, because look, Twitter is a cesspool sometimes of negativity. 
you're you're one of the most active wrestlers on Twitter, interacting with people. How was the mentions? It, you know, when the news broke towards you, negative, positive, down the middle. Um, I gotta tell you, I repressed a lot of it. <laughs> I didn't read much of it because it was so negatively underwhelming just to read. I was so fucking angry that that story even broke to begin with. I was so mad. I mean, really and sincerely, I was so fucking mad. Because I was just like, you know, I was more open than I wanted to be from the very get-go about my personal situation. And I just could not understand at all how the level of detail and all of that got out. Um, I... You know, a lot of fans reached out. I mean, I don't know. From what I recall, it was supportive. But just even the mere mention of it was infuriating. I was like, I can't believe people know about this. I really can't believe that they know about this since this is out there now. I was just so mad. So you you show up to the Impact tapings. You are being professional, uh, you know, despite asking for it. And obviously, we've seen that you're showing up to taping. So you were not granted. And I don't really want to talk too much about the conversation between you and the company because that's between you two to hash out. Do you, you you will continue to move forward and honor your dates with Impact? Well, I, I mean, look, I get along great with everybody, and I'm not mad at anyone. I'm not upset at anyone. Um, I'm mad that the article broke. I'm mad that the information's out there. But like, you know, it's business as usual. You know, I'm going to show up. I'm going to do the absolute best that I possibly can, um, and always put my best foot forward. And that's that's what it is. I love being there. Just uh, you know. Truthfully, I mean, it's, uh, I've got to figure out how to, you know, make everything work. I don't know how else to say it. I mean, I, I have to find a way to make it all work for myself and, you know, for the people that I, you know, need to take care of. Um, I mean, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at exhausting all options and being as successful as possible at this. And I've been doing that since I got started with this. That has never stopped. Just the way I have to go about that now is going to be very different, unfortunately. Um, so we'll see where everything lands, you know. I'm hoping uh, for some sort of unforeseen miracle to occur. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, probably fairly stupid, but I mean, I don't know. I, I, still, I still get up early in the morning and... Uh, I still train my ass off, and uh, I do the best that I can with putting my content out there. And I'm going to continue to place my faith in that, that everything will fall where it should. And uh, hope that as many people as possible see what I'm able to offer. And hopefully that translates to a monetary value that, where I can you know, obtain that and stabilize uh, everything that I need to. Like, again, I, I, I just can't say it enough. Like, it's, you know, I'm uh, just trying to do my absolute best and be rewarded for that. And it's really not any more complicated than that. There were rumors on the internet after the news broke, and it's probably the armchair pundits who think they know what's going on. And it's no secret that you and Scarlett are an item. She recently asked for her release. Is this, you know, because you guys are a couple and she wants to go where you go? Is this a supporting move? Does this even have anything to do with you? Uh, I can honestly tell you it has zero to do with me. Um, don't want to speak too much because, uh, I mean, this is a totally separate story, but, like, I hope that that situation gets rectified because, in my opinion, it's far worse than mine. So uh, that's all I'll say about it, but it has nothing to do with me okay. at all. All right. Um, so we got yeah, to put that just, to sleep. She doesn't, she, she doesn't, like, people don't even understand. Like, she lives at home with her mom, still has a side job. Um you know, like, she works a side job to support her wrestling. Like, for where she's at with things, like, really shouldn't be that way, in my opinion. And I think that a lot of people would agree with me. So she's she's doing the absolute best that she can. And I think where she's at right now is um, so far beyond what she's being compensated for. I think it would turn people's stomachs if they knew the details about that. Yeah, you know, I, I kind of wish I could move back in with my mom sometimes, in all honesty. You know, bills and pays. And, oh, boy. Man. Anyways, <laughs> but, but I tell you, back to this interview. Less about me and wanting to move back home with my mom. Um, you, you have been super professional here, and you're always one of my favorite people. I, I, I can't put you over enough online about how awesome of a guy you are. We, I mean, Pete, how often do we talk about Crosshair? 
Uh, I mean, I would say quite often. I mean, we've always talked about him. Even, even you and I, how cool the guy is. And, uh, you know, like, even the, the limited program I had with you, Kevin, I'm like, you know, very professional and always we're about business. And that's what I really appreciate it, you know. So, um, yeah, definitely. I, I've got a couple more questions. And then, you know, I definitely open the floor up to you, Kevin, to say anything else you want. And these are absolute questions I think, you know, fans want to hear and, and, and questions that I, I should be asked on the situation. You, you know, you're happy. Were, were, did you show up to these last set of tapings and any of the boys bring this up to you? I know a lot of times in a lot of locker rooms, you know, guys don't really talk about money and they keep that kind of stuff private. But impact locker rooms a little bit smaller and different. Did, did anybody approach you from the boys side? Everybody did. Uh, when the article broke, they most most of the boys knew that I didn't break the article. So they were reaching out to me going, what the fuck? They were sending it to me. Everyone was sending me these links of this stuff coming out going, who do you think did this? Um, so, I mean, we we all, I don't know, I mean, I, I, as far as I understand, we all protect each other pretty good. You know, we are uh, very much a family and we keep each other, you know, all of us uh, in the loop on all things. And uh, they've just been very supportive of uh, what I've been trying to do, which is just do the best that I can, really. Um, and I think that, you know, we, I don't know if I'm being biased, but I think that Impact has the strongest roster it's probably ever had in terms of work rate and in terms of uh, creative uh, output and, and stuff like that. Like, it's a really cool time to be a part of the company. And I have known all of these guys pretty much since, you know, even before I got there, before I elsewhere. Um, so it's just cool to be here and be there with them. And uh, everyone has been really, really supportive of my circumstances. And I'm, I'm not even going into the, in the, into the deepest of it because a, a lot of it has to do with other people and, you know, my family. They definitely don't want their business out there and I don't want it out there either. But people that are close to me know what I'm going through. People, you know, know what, I, what I'm trying to facilitate, I guess. So um, I don't know. That's, I guess that's the best way to summarize it. How, how much longer, if you don't mind answering this one, do you have left in your contract? I probably shouldn't say that. Okay. All right. No, nope. <laughs> probably shouldn't. Let's go to the, yeah, let's go to the yeah. next question. Just in case. Just uh, in case. Just thought I'd take my shot on that question. Sure. Um, um, do you do you think going forward with the company that there's there's room to, I guess, because you sound very understanding. Like, look, they run a business, and I'm and I'm an employee. And I'm not happy, and they can choose to either fix it or not, and we can move forward. D going forward, when it's time to negotiate a contract, you will definitely be negotiating from a position of power because they'll want you, and, and, and you know what you're worth. But will you be open to sitting back down and talking with Impact when that time comes back up? It's hard for me to answer that because I'm on a, I'm on a time situation. Like I don't really know how much time I'm afforded with the stuff that I'm having to deal with. So I really don't know. Like, I don't know how to answer that. Like, you know, speaking between the lines, I found out how much people were being paid and I wanted to be paid on the same scale as that. I wasn't asking for anything that was honestly unreasonable in all sincerity. And I'm not going to bullshit you guys. Um, I really wasn't. And uh, that's okay if the company does not agree that I'm worth that. I will not take offense to that. That's okay. It's not my company. I'm just an employee. And I'm not saying that because I think I'm supposed to say that. But if they really feel that way after one year, if they feel that I'm not worth what I'm asking, professionally, kindfully, please let me go somewhere else. And I will prove it to everyone that I can draw what I'm asking for for any company I work for. I will fucking get, I will put my life on it. On everything that is holy in my life, I will show everyone on this fucking planet alive that I can draw what I'm asking for. I think that's what all of us kind of think, especially, uh, you know, I know PD feels the same way. I, I feel, at least in the podcast and radio industry, you know, you give me a break and let me show you what I can do when you give me the chance or the break to be successful. And, uh, you know, I understand that from a, a talent point of view, that request, trust me, more than anything, you know, where you, you build yourself up, you build a brand, you, you think you've got a brand over, you get the break. And then you you want more because that's that's how good you think you are. 
Sure. There's nothing, I don't think that there's anything unusual or selfish or, or ridiculous about any of it. I mean, it's, we're talking about it, but I mean, it's, this may be shocking to people listening to it, but this is what every single person in this business goes through if they just <laughs> are not necessarily, you know, part of the breaking news, unfortunately. So people don't hear about stuff like this happening, but I think everyone goes through this. There's nothing unusual or unique, unfortunately, about the situation I'm in. This is what any, any person's going to go through in a, in a parallel or similar situation, you know? Uh, Pete, do you have anything? Because I've got a couple fan questions here for him. Yeah, we can hit up the couple fan questions and then, uh, yeah. Uh, this first one comes from Mike. Uh, he says he cooked an amazing medium rare steak for his wife. And him, un- unforgivingly, his lovely wife thought it was not cooked enough. So she microwaved it. How should I handle this, Killer Cross? I would have thrown <laughs> uh, throw- just throw the steak in the garbage first of all. He did it all wrong from the beginning. It was well done. I mean, if you overcook the steak, it's no good. Everybody knows that. If you've ever seen Raging Bull, I mean, this is gospel. So throw it in the garbage. Just start over the next day. Uh, Bert, <laughs> <laughs> Pete, how would you handle that? Uh, I think he said it right there. Yeah, I agree. I go, I go somewhere else to eat. I mean, I don't know what to say. <laughs> uh, Brandon wants to know, I would like to know about Killer Cross's workout and diet. What's his favorite to do thing to do in the gym? What does his diet consist of? What does he have on his cheat days uh, when he's off his diet? Okay, so May of last year, I started a carnivore diet, which was uh, just healthy fats and straight meat. Literally, that's it. And then I, uh, after two or three months, I started to put in uh, healthy fats like uh, omega-369, coconut oil, MCT oil, butter, and then I, um, it was just meats and fats. And then I, uh, kind of began adding in vegetables like kale, chard, uh, asparagus, spinach, broccoli. And, um, now where I'm at is I will kind of have like 30 to 120 grams of carbs a day, but I'm still keeping my proteins and fats high. And the reason I initially started the carnivore diet was because, uh, you know, I'm a large human being, so I generally don't fit inside airplane seats, comfortably at least. So with the travel, with all the dates, working out, and nothing beats you up worse than that canvas, um, I was in pain a lot. Uh, I don't take, uh, I don't like taking aspirin or Advil or any of that type of stuff because I believe that if your central nervous system is trying to tell you that something's wrong with your body, you shouldn't mask that. You should pay attention to it. So I was looking at different alternatives into lowering inflammation from uh, trauma and, uh, you know, getting hurt, whatever. Um, and I read a very interesting article that was uh, produced from Yale where it was saying that processed sugar and certain types of carbohydrates promote inflammation in your body. So I just cut all my carbohydrates out, and then I leaned out, and this is the best I've ever felt. Um, so I kind of – I just eat really, really clean now. I mean, I've done the carnivore diet. Now I've kind of – I'm putting carbs back into my diet, but – the types of carbs I'm eating are really just fruits and vegetables and, you know, the odd time I have like a donut or ice cream, but that's not very common. Uh, this question comes from Christopher. He wants to know, are there any matches that you would not personally want to do? Uh, like, PD, you're not a hardcore wrestling guy. You don't want thumbtacks. Mm-hmm. And I saw you on a ladder, too, by the way, and you looked a little wobbly on a wa- ladder, Pete. No, I, I'm good at ladder matches. I'm good at not getting hurt on ladder matches. But anyways... <laughs> Um, yeah, my thing is like I'm not into the hardcore chairs and thumbtacks and all that kind of stuff. Uh, well, I'm I'm open to doing anything right now, <laughs> especially right now. You yeah. can book me in an inferno match and set me on fire at this point. <laughs> wow, I I'm gonna I'm gonna try to book you to come hang out with me by the pool. I wonder how hard that is. Do you have an well, agent? He I have won't to call? take that booking at all. No, no. <laughs> that's the one. Stick. That's the one thing he says no to. You see, yeah. See hey, it. <laughs> the thing is, though, you can uh, you could put me in any match, just like you saw it over the weekend. They put me in a ladder match, and the ladder was like, like, all right, I'm gonna be smart about it and not get hurt, but still put on a very entertaining match. And that, I mean, that's how, that's what you got to do. It's just that's what you got to do. I could be in any match. I'm just gonna work very smart and try to be entertaining. Uh, well, th- this goes along the lines Randy wants to know. What's the scaredest you've ever been in the ring, whether it's an injury or a, a wrestling moment? I don't think I've ever really been scared in the ring, but I think, you know, 
one of the worst times was probably that match with Cage when I got up. Yeah. I couldn't I couldn't smell anything. I know it sounds weird, but I, I just I noticed that I couldn't smell anything when I stood up and I couldn't hear anything for a second. And I literally was watching him in slow motion quarter turning to hit a discus lariat and I was like I'm going to eat this one. This is going to be, this is going to be awful. Like I, it was the whole thing was happening in slow motion. I was really worried when that, when that was going on. And I, I was worried the whole way home because even as a passenger in the car going home that night, I was in Vegas. I was like, something's really wrong here. I, I knew something was really wrong. Like I can't even tell you how many times I've been flashed boxing you just shake that off. It's like nothing. It's absolutely nothing. Sometimes you get, you know, clipped. You get a full clip punch, this whatever, you know. And it's just like, yeah, yeah, I know he caught me there. Thank God I'm still awake. And, you know, you've got two more minutes to get out of the to get out of the round. You can, you know, keep somebody off, move around the ring, cut the whatever. But when that happened, I was just it was bad. I still don't even know how to summarize it. It was very bad though. That was probably one of the worst worst things that ever happened. Um and then, uh, I don't know, <laughs> on a funny note, working independent wrestling shows in Mexico is, is kind of nerve-wracking because generally I'm in the main and they never sweep the rings, uh, you know, efficiently. So when you go out there, all of the hardcore matches with thumbtacks and fiberglass and stuff is scattered all over the ring. So it doesn't matter what kind of match you're working, you're getting glass and thumbtacks and God knows what else in your back. So uh, that doesn't feel very good. It's not really something I'm looking forward to. And before we close out this interview, the last question, which I, you know, I perf- purposely didn't bring up in the interview, but I thought I'd save it for this fan question. McGill wants to know, you were recently at AEW's Double or Nothing sitting in third row. By the way, I took a picture of you. Is that a message to management? Which, I, you know, I think I've talked to you. I kind of know the answer, but I'll go ahead and let you talk. Not at all. I live in Las Vegas. My friends were working that night. (laughs) So sorry. (laughs) Sorry if I killed the romance of that for anybody. But, uh, you know, I know just about everybody on that card. And uh, I was really, really happy for them. I was really proud of them. And um, I think it was just such a cool thing to see. Um, It seemed like pro wrestling was back to life that night in a very big way. And uh, I stress the term pro wrestling because there's a very big difference between sports entertainment and pro wrestling and i was felt like i was watching pro wrestling that night um on a on a grand uh, stage you know and i'm not saying that maliciously or being obnoxious i just you know i i enjoy both but to me there's a huge difference between sports entertainment and pro wrestling and it was just cool to see that again i felt like i haven't seen that in an environment like that in a really long time you know just like lucha libre is different from sports entertainment or pro wrestling it's just it's just different, you know. It just felt different. It was really, really cool, and to see how people were so engaged with what they were doing that night, uh, man, it was just very cool. It was a very cool energy in the air. People were crying in the audience and the um, and Cody and Dustin match. Like, you don't get to see that very often. Like, people were literally weeping. Like, That's pretty powerful stuff, man. To move a whole building of people like that. Just take that in for a moment for anybody who's listening. You guys walk into a show. And you know it's a show, right? You're so certain that it's a show. You're so certain that this isn't real. And for a brief moment, you're taken out of that. You know, it's like a magic show, like a Copperfield show. You're so certain that magic's not real. And then you see something. And it physically changes you. And mentally and spiritually changes you. You can't just teach people how to do that. That's something that I think people are born with. It's, that's a talent that someone develops personally. You know, and... It was very cool to see that in the way that it was executed. It was very, very cool stuff. And I guess a follow-up question would be because, uh, you know, I look, I, I go to shows with PD, and I have a different view of the wrestling industry now that I guess I'm like an outsider looking in, but closer than I was when I was doing football stuff. And you go, when A, I guess when was the last time you actually got to sit down and watch a show as a fan? And B, now that you're in the industry, when you sit down and watch one as a fan, if, if you do have the time or do do it, how different do you watch matches? Um, the last time I watched a show may have been years ago. I actually like to sit in an audience and watch a show. I don't I can't even remember when the last time it was that I did that. Maybe five or six years ago. So growing up, going to wrestling shows, I just for whatever reason, I haven't done it. Um, part of it's really difficult for me um, because I want to be in the ring. So it's kind of like 
you know, you want to get up there and you see the whole room moving and you can feel all the energy. You, you know, if you love this, you want to maestro that you want to be there. So it's, it's kind of hard to sit there and watch it, but um, I was definitely watching as a fan that night. I thought it was awesome. And uh, it's different when you're watching backstage, when you're backstage, you're with the people you work with and it's somewhat analytical. Um, sometimes when the matches are really good, it'll, you know, Petey's seen it, like, and you've seen it too. People, people, mm-hmm. we all freak out backstage when really cool things pop off and, you know, we react just like fans, you know, we were, we were fans before all of this. And I think it's healthy to maintain, um, that sort of spirit in all things to still remember what being a fan felt like, because that's, you know, our consumer, that's our demographic. Without them, none of us would be doing this. If the building was empty, I really highly doubt very many of us would be going out there and doing what we do. Now, I guess I should ask you, are, are you happy with the way this went down? Um, or did, did, do, did you feel like you got everything out? Is there anything that we didn't touch on that you feel like we should talk about? There's going to be so many things, man, that we're not going to be able to touch down on just for legality purposes. And, and also just like, as I said, I'm very private. You know, I would love, I would love to be able to uh, to share deeper stuff about everything. I just, I can't bring myself to do it. I really can't put myself out there to be that vulnerable to do it. Um, it just doesn't feel right. And I'm going to ask that uh, everyone be patient with uh, what winds up happening, and hopefully everything lands where it's supposed to. You know, and uh, I appreciate everyone's interest in. Uh, I don't know, having an interest in what's going on. I thought it was kind of flattering to see how many people actually gave a shit. And um, I just, I get tunnel vision with when I'm working towards something. I get tunnel vision. I really don't pay attention to a whole lot other than the task at hand. And I've been so hell-bent on trying to get somewhere with all of this, with my career, that uh, I rarely stop to just look around and go, oh, this is where I am. Like, oh, this is what's going on, you know? And I guess if anything... If anything good came out of this, it was to see what the perception was of my value, I guess, from the audience. I I thought that was uh, somewhat flattering, but I wish it. Uh, I wish the story never broke. I really do. I wish it didn't break, and I wish things were different uh, with the grounds that I'm on with the company. Because uh, I'd like to stay, but if I'm uh, if that's impossible, then that's impossible, and that's what it's going to be. So. You know, I do want to apologize on behalf of PD because with him always asking all these questions, I didn't even have a chance to talk to you during this interview. <laughs> yeah, so I do have one last question. Um, so, Kevin, where can people find you uh, on social media and stuff like that if they want to interact with you and all that? Well, if one more article breaks, you're not going to find me anywhere. I'm going to be in jail. <laughs> so, um, but uh, you can go to KillerCross.com, and that has all of my social media and my videos and everything attached to it. So um, killercross.com is probably the best place to go. And then as well, uh, check out my YouTube channel. I built a channel where everyone could backtrack everything I've ever done in my career and all the recent latest stuff. And uh, the most recent video was uh, was basically a return short film to something that John Moxley oh, yes. Used. I didn't even talk about this. You dumb bastard. I know. Pete. I listen, Petey and I were talking about this and how genius this video was. And I just, I got to tell you, uh, I watched it and thought this was amazing. Are we going to get more John Moxley videos? Is he in on this? What can you tell us about this John Moxley thing? This is what I will tell you. I was amazed and shocked that no one did this before me because when I heard that he was going to be on the independence and he was going to be doing all this stuff, I was like, cool. I uh, wonder, wonder what he's going to be up to immediately. And I'm waiting for, you know, all this stuff to happen. And then, you know, he had put out all these videos, like movie trailers, basically, of, you know, him breaking loose and all the metaphors and stuff like that. And it actually kind of inspired me to do this. I was really inspired by what he had to say on Talk is Jericho. And I was really inspired by the, the amount of work and the passion that he's putting into his stuff. And I thought, you know, we both are in the same city and I might as well put this out there and, and see if uh, people would be interested to see this on the independence or wherever. And, um, you know, a lot of it also is has to do with me trying to exhaust all options and improve in my own personal circumstances and professionally. And I think that him and I would be able to kill it. And I definitely think that him and I would be able to pull a house anywhere we go. Oh, absolutely. Together, so. did, did he see it? Do you know if he saw it? Have you heard any feedback from it? Because I, I will say nothing. Oh, I'll say nothing. oh, come on, Kev. Come on. Time will tell. <laughs> Time oh, will tell. 
All right, we are going to send you back to your lair, and you can go back to torturing souls and making them pay the tollman. Uh, hopefully, we'll have you back on another time where we can have some tomfoolery and more fun. I uh, thank you first of about uh, from PD and I for trusting us enough to help get this out and, and at least talk about it. I mean, I appreciate it. Uh, you guys have always been good to me since day one, and I've told you both that. And there's a reason why I only spoke to the both of you about this publicly and nobody else. So I appreciate it sincerely. All right, Kev, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Kev.